Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice. The rings of Saturn. They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D ring. It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So, people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better, but then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. 
Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit, because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. Now think about building a base on a space object. But your best friend lands on another one a few miles away. Then, a giant icicle crashes into his rock and increases its speed. And a few days later, your friend is too far away. And it happens all the time. The only way to change your life is to settle on one of Saturn's moons. The planet has 83 of them. People have already confirmed and named 63, and the existence of 20 others has yet to be confirmed. They're all like different worlds. Some of them may be habitable, and the best candidate among them is Titan. There may be water on it, and its atmospheric pressure is only one and a half times greater than Earth's. Its atmosphere consists of nitrogen and a little methane, forming carbon smog in Titan's upper layers. For this reason, we can't study this moon from Earth. But the coolest thing is that Titan flies outside the rings of Saturn. This means people can lead a quiet life there. There's also satellite Phoebe, covered with craters like our moon. This giant celestial body looks more like a gigantic meteorite. People have a lot of choices of where to start a new life. During a couple of hundred years spent on ships near Saturn, humanity would learn everything about its satellites. But why did they try to live on the rings? Why didn't they land on one of the moons from the very beginning? Because, well, then this video would be less fun and a whole lot shorter. But what if we were initially born inside the rings of Saturn? Let's say a massive meteorite with frozen water got caught by the planet's gravity. There were the simplest life forms inside the ice. And then, this life began to acquire more developed forms. Imagine that the large rock managed to remain untouched for hundreds of millions of years. And during this time, humans appeared. But of course, they would be very different there. Firstly, they wouldn't experience gravitational forces. This would make them taller, but weaker. People's skin would be pale because of the lack of light, but very hardy thanks to cold temperatures. Particles of ice and grains of sand flying in space would roughen people's skin. In such biological armor, without gravity, they would jump from one rock to another in search of food and water. And by the way, that would be the main problem. How would people survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space? Where would they get their food? Saturn's rings are a pretty lifeless and dangerous place. If there are not even the simplest forms of life there, then how could such a complex one as the human appear? Therefore, even in theory, the appearance of people would be impossible there. Why do we love Saturn so much? Right, because we love its amazing rings. The planet stands out in the solar system because of them. The major rings have a diameter of 170,000 miles, yet their thickness does not exceed 330 feet. Saturn's slowest outermost ring spins at about 37,000 miles per hour. It's slower than the rotation of Saturn itself. But did you know that Saturn was ringless for most of its history? Let's find out how they were formed. Using Cassini's final plunge into the planet, researchers could estimate the ring's mass, 33 billion billion pounds. Further, they have determined that the rings were between 10 to 100 million years old, much younger than the planet itself. The thing is that the rings only look solid. They are made of billions of rock and ice chunks. They are primarily tiny ones, looking like grains of sugar to those as large as a house or even as mountains. The innermost chunks of ice and rock shoot through space at about 52,000 miles per hour. 
there are mysterious spokes in its rings. It seems they form and disperse within a couple of hours, and these spokes might consist of electrically charged sheets of tiny particles formed when small meteors hit the rings, or maybe electron beams from Saturn's lightning. One theory says Saturn's rings have formed all that extra material that remained after Saturn began, which is a material that couldn't create a moon. There's also a theory that says there was Theia, a Mars-sized planet that collided with Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. Lighter crust parts ended up in space during the impact, whereas its denser core stayed behind. But in the case of Saturn, all that debris perhaps didn't put a new moon together, but it formed rings many people today recognize this planet for. Another theory is that rings formed from dust and debris of a moon that ended up destroyed by this big impact, maybe by an asteroid or comet. Or perhaps the rings are there because once a moon fell apart because of the tidal forces coming from its parent planet itself. If these rings formed at the same period as Saturn did, they would have had more than 4 billion years to collect a bit of debris and dirt coming from micrometeorite collisions. But these rings mainly consist of water ice, no dirt at all, which means they're younger than expected. And the nature of this ring system tells us a thing or two about Saturn's fuzzy inside. Fuzzy means its core is like sludge. The helium and hydrogen in Saturn mix with more and more rock and ice over time, the closer you go to the planet's core. It's similar to what you see in our oceans. The deeper you go, the level of saltiness increases. But the rings may disappear in the far future. Rings are generally more common than we think. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own ring system. But not every planet has the same ones. Saturn has a fascinating halo, and definitely the most spectacular rings, true. Others mostly have rings made of dust and rocky particles, and not just planets. Other space bodies can have rings, like the asteroid called Chiricla. But even though the gas giants of our solar system have rings, rocky, or so-called terrestrial ones, don't. And one theory says it might have been that way because gas planets in the outer area of the solar system protected those rocky ones that formed in the inner solar system from all those collisions that possibly could have formed rings around them. Or it could be because gas giants are way bigger and their enormous volume allows them to have a ring system that can remain stable. And what if Earth had rings in the past too? Maybe in the time of the big collision when our moon could have been formed. Now to some more cool things happening in our solar system. Pluto, a tiny dwarf planet at the edge of our solar system. Also the one we used to call a planet has a pretty bizarre atmosphere. No one expected to see a haze there go as high as 1,000 miles. That means it rises higher above the surface of the atmosphere of our home planet. And the atmosphere on Pluto has around 20 layers. They're more compact and way cooler than scientists expected. And tons of nitrogen gas escape Pluto by the hour. But the dwarf planet still finds a way to constantly create new supplies of all the nitrogen it had lost. One theory says it probably produces these supplies through geological activity. Our moon is pretty peaceful, but that's not something we can say for Io, one of Jupiter's moons. This one has hundreds of volcanoes. It's the moon with the most volcanic activity in our solar system. Io sends plumes of sulfur up to an incredible 190 miles into its atmosphere. Its volcanoes emit many particles and gases into the space right next to Jupiter every single second. Its eruptive activities happen because of Jupiter's mighty gravitational forces and magnetic field. The insides of Io tense up and relax all the time, depending on how close or far away it is from Jupiter. And that's why it generates enough energy to have such an eruptive nature. Speaking of volcanoes, Mars has one larger than the whole state of Hawaii. At first, you'd probably say it's a quiet and peaceful planet. But once upon a time, enormous volcanoes dominated its surface. Yup, that includes a well-known Olympus Mons, the largest volcano ever found in our entire solar system, 374 miles across, comparable to the size of Arizona. Olympus Mons is 16 miles high, three times the height of our tallest mountain, Mount Everest. And by its volume, this volcano is 100 times bigger than the largest one on Earth. 
Mars can have such big volcanoes because its gravity is significantly weaker than the one on our home planet. Also, the crust on Earth moves all the time, unlike the Martian crust. Do you know how the Hawaiian Islands formed? A hot spot in the mantle created a chain of volcanoes in the crust floating above it. A Martian volcano may grow bigger because its surface isn't moving, so a volcano could build up for a longer time in just one spot. Miranda is one of the most bizarre moons in the outer part of our solar system. It's a shadowy moon that orbits Uranus, with many craters, sharp ridges, and similar disruptions on its surface. Usually, this type of relief tells a certain area used to have a lot of volcanic activities. But that wasn't the case with Miranda. Also, this moon is way too small to generate tectonic activities, another element that could form this type of surface. One theory says the gravitational force from Uranus could have caused the push-pull action, something that made all these bumps on Miranda's surface. We'll have to send another spacecraft to find out what was happening there. We are all made of stardust. 97% of atoms we're made of are the same as the material our galaxy consists of. The building blocks of life is a term we use for a group of elements that are vital for life on Earth. And stars have these elements too, but in different proportions. For instance, we are 65% oxygen by our mass, whereas elements we measure in space, like the spectra of stars, have less than 1% of oxygen. So, Mercury is already the smallest in our solar system in the planet category, excluding some other bodies like the dwarf planet Pluto. And now it looks like it's still shrinking. It's the second densest after our planet, but it's getting denser over time. Researchers thought the Earth was the only planet in our solar system with tectonic activities for a long time. And now we know Mercury is tectonically active too. Messenger spacecraft managed to map the whole planet. Scientists realize the planet is full of fault scarps, some cliff-like landforms. Since these are relatively small, they're probably young, and Mercury is still contracting even 4.5 billion years after our solar system was formed. You're relaxing in your room and streaming some good tunes when suddenly the network's down. You try rebooting your phone, but there's still no connection. Out of nowhere, your sister barges into your room in panic. She's screaming something about rings. Boxing rings? Wedding rings? Rings on the tub? She's not making any sense. So she drags you out of the house and shows you the sky. You take a look up and see streaks of objects forming miles above the Earth's surface. Her connection seems to work. The two of you check online what's going on, and everywhere the same thing is making headlines. Rings are suddenly appearing in our sky. Hashtag Earth Rings is breaking the record, and videos are going super viral. Your sister can't help but join the crowd and takes a bunch of selfies with the sky. You run to the TV in your living room to check out the news. Scientists are warning about a coming catastrophe and explaining that everyone should remain indoors. Even though it's a cloudless day in the middle of summer, the weather seems to be getting colder and colder. Suddenly, the signal's cut off. Other channels show nothing either. Then you see your neighbors packing their bags and heading out. Others follow suit. You hesitate a bit, but decide to do the same in the end. Your sister is still outside taking selfies when you urge her to come along with you to seek some answers. The two of you hop in your car and drive out into the city. The rings above seem to be gaining more mass with each second. You and your sister are getting colder and colder. You head to the university to see if anyone knows anything, but there's no one there. Only one parked car in the lot. And it's a good thing you recognize that car. You and your sister rush in and find the astronomy professor doing some quick calculations and trying to figure out why all this is happening. He urges you to take seats and begins explaining. No one knows what this is all about, but it's limiting the sun's exposure on Earth, which explains why it's getting colder by the minute. Why the rings are getting thicker is a mystery too. On Saturn, the rings are made up of ice and rock particles. They can be as small as an ant or the size of a bus. The rocks could be left over meteor debris or even remnants of dwarf planets. But since Earth is so close to the Sun, ice wouldn't be something you'd find floating above us. With all these rocks piled up, they block the Earth's access to Sun to warm us up and give us light. The professor goes on to explain that Earth will enter a new ice age, 
and oxygen levels will deplete within a year's time unless those newborn rings disappear anytime soon. This also explains why there's no connection. The rocks that form the rings are hitting and breaking the satellites. Suddenly, you hear a loud ringing noise outside. The three of you head outside and see a helicopter blasting an alarm with a red light flashing. Everyone to your homes now! This is not a drill! Everyone, head home! You get in your car with your sister, but the roads are jammed. You have to go on foot, which will take two hours. There's no way anyone can remain outdoors. You venture out seeing everyone stuck on the road. They're all arguing with each other and causing chaos. You try not to get caught in the middle of anything and sneak your way to the highway. With the rings getting thicker, less sunlight is breaking through. This Ice Age info is stuck in your head, chilling you even more. You take a deep breath and see a thin mist coming out of your mouth. The sky is getting darker and you're still not home yet. Your sister is tired and needs to rest, but you urge her to move on. You find an abandoned clothes shop and head inside. The store clerks are actually giving away thick jackets for everyone to wear. You grab a couple and slip them on. Only one more hour to get home, but the sky is completely dark. There's no way you and your sister can go out in such conditions. So you decide to camp up in the clothes shop. They set up a mini bonfire in the middle of the shop and create makeshift sleeping bags with the rest of the unused clothes. Luckily, there's enough food to feed everyone, including you and your sister. It's the middle of the night. The fire goes out, and you can't see outside the shop. You head to the window and open it up. A huge pile of snow spills in and wakes everyone up. It's the middle of August, and a snowstorm formed overnight. Everyone is freezing, and they start the fire anew. There's no radio or any way to find out what's happening. The wind picks up and starts shaking the shop. Things start falling off the shelves, but you and everyone else are cozy by the fire. The next day, you look outside and see the entire area covered in snow. You live in a sunny place where it barely rains, and the rings in the outer atmosphere are even bigger than last night. Out of nowhere, a truck filled with people pulls over, and the driver tells you there's a shelter for everyone some miles away. The truck has chains all over the tires and is equipped for the worst snowy conditions. Even though it's morning, the sky is pretty dark. You and everyone else hop in. Abandoned cars, some with their doors still open, are scattered all over. The truck drives around them or just smashes through the ones in the way. It pulls over next to an ambulance and takes all the equipment to help the ones in need. You drive past your neighborhood and see your entire house covered in snow. The large tree in your backyard has fallen under the weight of the snow and broken the roof, allowing snow to flood in. The truck speeds through and gets to the shelter, which, to your surprise, is the mall. You get out and see many of the townspeople being led to various stores that have now turned into dorms and health units. You're left in a sports store with a bunch of other people. Your sister has also been able to bunk with you. And to your luck, you see the professor helping out some people. But shortly after that, a loud explosion blasts through the mall and shatters glass screens. Everyone ducks for cover. You see people running outside. You head out and see a large metallic object lying in front of the mall entrance. There are people crowding the entire area, so it's not easy to see what all the fuss is about. But after getting a closer look, you find out it's a satellite fallen from orbit. It crashed in the front yard and made the boom. There were also reports of other satellites crashing on Earth in the most random places. That means all communication has been wiped out of the map. You run back inside the mall to await what happens next. You look at your sister in fear, not knowing that the new Ice Age has just begun. One year later, you're relaxing in your bunker when your sister barges in, freaking out. The rings are still there, but it's something else now. You run outside and see everyone gathering around and looking at the sky. Within a year, temperatures have dropped to freeze the entirety of the Earth's surface. Deserts and tropical jungles have turned into icy wastelands. More than half of the wildlife went extinct, and trees are as rare as a four-leaf clover, which means oxygen levels have dropped significantly. Most of the population, or what's remaining of it, live with oxygen tanks, with scientists still trying to crack the case of the rings. 
exactly what the professor predicted. But up in the sky, rocks seem to be falling down and crashing all over. It starts off far away, but then the rocks begin to fall down close by. You and everyone else run back into the mall, which has been covered with a layer of metal to keep the warmth inside. It should be pretty safe in there. If the rocks are falling down, that means the rings are dissipating. Suddenly, you're full of hope that the Ice Age might be over soon.